Okay, good morning. Here we go. Uh, if you'd like to follow along, I'm going to read um, from the 17th chapter of the Gospel of God. Uh, today, we're going to be studying that in some detail. And um, we're also going to do the review toward the end. So, um, beginning with verse 33 of chapter 16... I'm going to read that first, and then begin with chapter 17. That verse 1633 says, I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome this world. Now 17. <coughs> Father, the time has come, Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me, in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. And now verse 6 and following, where Jesus prays for his disciples. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I give them the words, and you gave them me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those that you have given me. For they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they will still be in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None of them have been lost, except for the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture might be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world uh, any more than I am of that world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that you too may be truly sanctified. And now Jesus prays for the believers. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, <coughs> I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me, and I have loved them, even as you have loved them. 
Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, who the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them. And that I myself may be in them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> help us today to get new insight <clears throat> into the words of Jesus and what he is saying. We thank you for this prayer that John has been able to record it and been able to give it to us and give us this kind of insight. Thank you for your love and thank you for this week. And as we go into the next week, may we find the value in knowing the truth. And your word is truth. We pray in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> Repeat after me. <coughs> Jesus performed many other signs. Many other signs. In the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing what? You may have life in his name, or eternal life. That's all. Okay, good. Almost got it. <laughs> a little more. A little more time, we'll do it. Okay, let's get down to work here. We're going to have an interesting day. Um, this prayer is frequently referred to as the high priestly prayer. Anybody want to guess why? Because what? Jesus is interceding for us like the high priest would interceding for Israel. Okay, Jesus is interceding for us like the high priest would uh, intercede for Israel, okay? All right, I get that. All right, here's what, uh, here's what I want you to know. If you, if you turn to chapter 17, stay there. Uh, I think it's, um, oh, yeah, I don't know what I do with your list, what I do with it. Here it is. It's um, 1 through 5. 17, 1 through 5, she put 15, but it's 1 through 5, okay? And basically, Jesus prays for himself. You heard me read that. Then John 17, 6 through 19, he prays for his disciples, okay? And in 17, 20 through 26, for the believers, you and me. So we're going to look at this, and we're going to look at what he says and why he says it the way he says it. And... Uh, and then we'll, we'll go back and talk a little bit more about some other things. We're also going to be introduced to a king this morning. His name is Melchizedek. Interesting guy. Uh, has a lot to offer. We're also going to go back and talk about Abraham again. Because Abraham and Melchizedek kind of got together. And there was a reason for that. And then we're also going to look at one of the most amazing things you've ever seen. And that is, we talked about how the covenant of Moses is null and void, right? But now we're going to know why. You're going to get why. God's going to answer that question for you. Okay? And this will be pretty fascinating. Now the first thing I want to tell you is, there are two prayers that we have in Scripture. One's recorded in Matthew and some other places, and this one is recorded in John. The one's called the Lord's Prayer. Jesus could not pray the Lord's Prayer. Right? Why? Well, forgive my sins. So he couldn't. Yeah. How, how, how do you do that? He, he, he cannot pray that prayer. And you and I 
cannot pray this prayer. Right? Unless you have some glory stored up in heaven we don't know about. <laughs> All right. It's interesting. So, why is chapter 17, by all these commentaries and people that write books and all this kind of why is it all referred to as a high priestly prayer? I'm going to give you some reasons for how this is all put together. So, you might want to get a clean piece of paper or a note or a back on one of the, one of the handouts that were given to you or something, so you can take some notes on some things. The reason it's called, <clears throat> the, Jesus is called the high priestly prayer is because Jesus was given this priestly function in the order of Melchizedek. Now that's a crazy name. It's M-E-L, and then Chez, C-H-I-Z, and then E-D-E-K. Okay, if you have it right, you list it. Okay? And he's practicing it. He's practicing it even though he really doesn't fully function in that position until when? Seated in the right hand of the Father. That's right. Sitting at the right hand of the Father until he ascends to heaven. That's where he really <clears throat> functions as the high priest. And he just doesn't function as a high priest. He functions as the high priest and the king forever and ever. And we'll find out why and how that works. But he will become the great mediator, as, as Eddie said, and, and, and uh, intercession for us, for his people, and all the rest. So let's, let's look at this. There are some key words. When you first read 17, 1 through 5, uh, the first thing that comes to your mind is this word, glory. Restore your glory to me that I had before the world began? Wow. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's, uh, that's a very powerful word. And if you notice, John uses glory a lot in, this, in, in the Gospel of John. So that's important. The other thing is in 17, 6 through 19, where Jesus starts to pray for his disciples, he uses keywords like for, here are the reasons, for, because, for, verse 8, for example, verse 9, but, there's a contrast. Uh, he uses the word world, word, sanctify, okay, what's that mean, okay, then in John 17, 20 through 26, he uh, prays for believers, you and me, um, those of us who are waiting, believing in Christ, waiting for that special time in history where he returns, here he uses the word unity. Unity doesn't mean that the churches should all get together with all the other denominations and beliefs in the world and become one and sing the Coke song. That's not what that means. <laughs> all right. This unity is your unity as a believer with, believe it or not, the Trinity. Your unity with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Your unity. And as a believer, you are to unify with the Trinity. That should tell you something about you again. Here, go, here we go with John. He's going to try to convince you that you are something special. You are not the typical pagan on the street. There's a lot going on in your life. Just like Gary told me this morning. All right? A lot going on. And it's very, very important that you know about it. So, let's first of all look at the, uh, the Levit Leviticus. When you think of priest, you think of what? You know, the Levites. The Old Testament Levites who made all the offerings, gave all the offerings. I just quickly outlined a few things here. Chapters 1 through 7 of Leviticus talks about loving God means making your offerings. Doing them on time. Getting the right offering for your sin. And providing it. Chapters 1 through, or 11 through 15, talk about God's perspective on sin. 
how he sees it, and how he sees the need for purification. And chapter 17 through 24 talks about God requires we live a holy life. Now, uh, Jess, can I get you to put up the uh, the uh, Gospel of John? Oh, John. Uh huh. Yeah. If you notice where we are, 17, we're in that private ministry, but it's past some of the dialogue and dissertations that he has with his disciples and conversations, and now we're at a place where he begins to pray. He's going to pray in a little bit here for himself with the Father, but he's going to distance himself from the disciples when he does that. But right now, he's allowing them to hear everything that he's saying. And he's listening to everything. He does take a couple of disciples with him uh, who fall asleep on him. But basically he does do that. But uh, that's all part of that process. Now, the question becomes the background and what is important about this Levitical, this book of Leviticus. Okay? I'm going to give you some points here. Leviticus is about ceremonial law. Now, Ceremonial law through which sinful people know about God's holiness and that God does not tol tolerate that kind of sin. God designed those for the tribe of Levi. And the tribe of Levi was set aside to be priests, which is where they came up with the idea of Levit Leviticus, which comes from to serve as priests, to serve as a priest, okay? to implement the ceremonial laws that God laid down with Moses at Sinai. So not only did he give the laws that, what you call the Ten Commandments and, and some other things, uh, but he also, uh, you know, laid down some of these important ceremonial laws that need to be followed. So God's holiness and the holiness of God's people are the entire theme of Leviticus. That's what it's all about. The message to the Israelite nation was your lack of holiness is why you cannot love rightly each other or me, and why you cannot be faithful and live a loving life. That's all part of that. For nearly 2,000 years, the Jews practice this ceremonial law. It's a long time. 2,000 years. Okay. Judaism became a closed system. It did not go out looking for to uh, proselyte other people and bring them in. That's not what they were all about. And much of the opposition to Jesus that you remember uh, from the Jews and their leadership was a refusal to understand the New Covenant. Absolute refusal. Because of what? The Mosaic Covenant. That's who we, that's our man, Moses. And we follow him. He had a relationship with God. Now what you're going to see this morning is how God takes that apart piece by piece. And says, yes, it served its point. But that's not where we are. Okay? So, we have this outline, and I'll share with you up there. I don't want to go into any more detail on that. I just want you to be aware a little bit about where this is all coming from. Okay, this Levitical law and ceremonial stuff. Now I want to go to your friend Abraham. <laughs> Abraham and his relationship to Melchizedek. If you want to, you can just call him the big M or something like that. If you don't want to try to pronounce that word all the time, uh, that's fine. Um, but how does this affect the lives of Abraham, David, and Jesus? How does this king, how does this guy get in to the middle of all the plan of salvation? The story is told that Abraham found out <coughs> that Lot and his family... Uh, and some other Jews were actually uh, part of a raid, a raiding party, uh, that was attacking uh, Sodom. Okay? Remember Sodom? 
okay, Tamar, Sodom, okay. The king of Sodom uh, was, was taken captive, and some of the other uh, people were taken captive. And here's what you need to know. These raiding parties are not like, they're not like armies of thousands of men coming in and taking over and fighting and conquering something. Uh, they, were, they were a bunch of kings like, it would be like the mayors of four or five cities getting together with their best ten guys <laughs> and going to other cities and raiding them, you know, and uh, going to City Hall and raiding City Hall and taking all their stuff and running, okay? And when Abraham found out about this, Abraham, by faith, decided that he was going to go after them. He was going to get Lot back, and he's going to get every bit of the, the booty and stuff that they stole from all of these cities back. And uh, it's kind of comical if you could picture it in your mind. Here's the raiding party. They come in, they raid, they steal some women, and they steal some jewelry, and they steal this and that, and then they take off. And they start running, you know, toward the next town. You know, and it wasn't horses and chariots and stuff. This was along the ground. So Abraham gets some men together. <clears throat> and uh, in Genesis 14, it tells you what happened. It's the first time we hear about Abraham's faith being honored. And, and you'll hear why it was honored in just a minute. But he took off after these guys. And what, the way he would do it is when he caught up to them, he would take what's his and then leave. And then they would go to the next place and raid it, you know, and if, then they would have to go after him and get their stuff. And sometimes they, they, they travel as much as 140 miles. This is on running, you know, on the ground, chasing these little raiding parties around, trying to get their stuff back. And, and, and that's basically what happened. So, as this came to an end, Abraham got his stuff back and came back. And the story goes that Abraham's faith was being honored by a king who came out to thank him. His name was Melchizedek. And in uh, Genesis 14, 18, it says this. He was a priest of the Most High God. Keep that in mind. That's not used anywhere else. Priest of the Most High God. Now, where are we? Where are we located right now? We're back in the Abraham and the Old Testament. Keep that in mind. It's important. All right. So what happens is Melchizedek brings rations for, for Abraham's 25, 50, 100 guys or whatever he could get together. And he gives them some food. And... Uh, they talk and, and they have a relationship and, and, and things go along. And little by little, Abraham responds to, to Melchizedek uh, by they eat his bread and they drink his wine. And uh, he responds back by giving him a tithe, 10% of everything that he had. The only, only people that you would give a tithe to in the Old Testament was who? The, 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 the Levites. Right. The priests. They had no income. So everybody, when they bought their gifts, they, they tithed to the priests so they could buy things and food and live and whatever. They were the, uh, like a the pastor of, 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 of the temple. Okay? So that's basically how it worked. Now the next time we hear about Melchizedek, and I'll tell you about this in a second, it has a relationship to um, David. I want you to get this chart. <clears throat> Put it in front of you. Yep. All right, watch this. <clears throat> Remember when we talked about Abraham before? We talked about the Abrahamic covenant, and we talked about faith, seed, land, and blessing. We didn't spend too much time on seed, but we're going to now. Okay? We're going to look at the seed, find out what the seed's all about. And uh, God's first act of salvation was the promise of a Messiah. 
Interesting. This is going to come out of this conversation, and you'll see how this matriculates. There was a separation of Lot. Abraham joined three other kings, all defeated uh, the southern big king. Uh, and um, uh, the king of Sodom came to Abraham and offered him, you know, oh, we would like uh, to, to, to give you things. And Abraham turned it down. Why? Somebody tell me why. But Melchizedek, he takes, not only does he give him 10%, but Mikhail Zedek then blesses it. Why did he turn the king of Sodom down? He was, he was on the right side. He was a good guy this time. Because what was Sodom all about? So really bad city. Yeah. And Abraham knew that. And he was not willing to fellowship with the king of Sodom. Even though he saved his people and his goods and, and all the rest of it. But he did fellowship with Melchizedek. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But Melchizedek is the king of Salem, uh, uh, Salem, and he meets Abraham, like we just said here in 14, 18 through 20. Now, I put something here for you to, to note. Uh, it says, uh, he offered him bread and wine. The king offered him bread and wine. And I've heard this a lot of times. There is no connection. Put not Communion. We left up the word not there. Not communion. It is not a forerunner of communion in the future. That is not there. Okay? That's a big stretch to make that a typology. You know? That one is not legit. Okay? And I want you to be aware of that because you'll hear it when people talk about it. And there's a lot of other things you'll hear too, but I think you'll be able to figure them out. He blesses Abraham and Abraham ties. Now, look what we have over here. We have this Mosaic Covenant, right? Next. It's a conditional covenant. The legal code, sacrificial offering, blessings under Levitical ceremonial law, which we just talked about. It's chosen tribe of Jehovah. And the order of Melchizedek changes the Levitical order of the priesthood and eventually, the law. Now that's phenomenal. We'll talk about it in a minute, but I want you to see it now. All right? What's the relationship with the Davidic covenant? Watch this. Remember David? The kingdom will last forever. The temple will be last forever. And the throne of David, of Judah, will last forever. There it is there. David is a songwriter. He writes Psalm 110 a thousand years after Melchizedek. I want you to get this so that when the light goes on, you'll go, whoa. You know, it's really amazing. A thousand years after Melchizedek. And another thousand years before Jesus was born. And David writes about this. The Lord Yahweh said to my Lord, Messiah, this is how it starts out, sit at my right hand. Then David knows and practices Melchizedekian priesthood, and you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. We find that in his song. And David functions as a prophet here to bring to us information we would have never known if God would not have inspired him to show us this. So Melchizedek helps put the psalm together that points to Jesus as the Messiah. Messiah, remember, means anointed one. That's all that means, okay? Now, if you look at the little chart, the other little chart, we'll see how he did this. What I try to do for you here is to try to point out that the 150 Psalms are divided into five books, all right? And basically what we have is Book 5 contains Psalm 107 through 150. But inside of Book 5, in the few first Psalms, 107 to 113 is a small unit. And that unit within itself 
has a very critical, important message. If we had time, we would go verse by verse through Psalm 107, 108, and 109, and we would hear the clamoring of the people for a deliverer. Bring us somebody, someone to save us, someone to make it work. And then, 110. And this is where David reveals Jesus is not only king, but high priest. That's a no-no. Remember we read about that in, in uh, Deuteronomy? You cannot be a king and a high priest. Who do we know they got in trouble for that? Saul. 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 You betcha. Jesus is going to become the first high priest of the God Most High forever and ever. We'll see how that works. David explains that. And then guess what? Psalm 111, 112, and 113 are jumping up and down, praising God for the deliverance that's going to happen through this prophecy. I want you to see that because that is phenomenal. And from time to time, uh, you know, I like to recommend books to you and things like this. For those of you who want to go a little deeper, <laughs> not, not super deep, but you can't understand, but uh, readily. Is, is, a, is an interesting guy. He's professor of Jewish studies at Moody Bible Institute. And he's got great credentials and all the rest of it. He wrote this book called The, the Messianic Hope. What it does is it goes through the entire <coughs> Old Testament and shows you that it's all about Jesus. It's not about all the other things you read there. They're important, and you need to know them. But how this actually shows what's going to happen in the New Testament. Fascinating book. It's got a whole chapter on Psalm 110, which is really good. And you'll get different perspectives on it. I'm giving you my perspective based on my hermeneutic, which is... Huh? Come on. What's our hermeneutic in here? Literary approach. Literary approach, but what's the hermeneutic? Authors and scripture. James comes uh, up here and interprets scripture for you? <laughs> no. <laughs> scripture interprets the scripture. That's how we find it out. And that's the hermeneutic this guy uses. Fantastic. I didn't know that until I pulled this out of my library. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> so, you know, a bit, but it's a fascinating book. All right, I just want you to be aware of it. Called the Messiah Hope. Okay, by Michael Redden. All right, now, where that takes us is, is over to the New Covenant. And if you look at the New Covenant, and of course, under David, uh, you know that in, write this down, 2 Samuel 23, 1 through 5. 2 Samuel 23, 1 through 5. What that does is it, it's about David's last words. The last words he speaks, I'm just kidding, a lot. And basically what he does, he's, he identifies the Messiah. And I thought you would enjoy reading that. You can do that in your own. It's the same thing that was read to us, uh, one of the college students, I don't know, was J. Bell, or somebody read that uh, verse in Luke. Luke 1, 31 through 33 where it talked about the subscription to Mary, you know, the angel appearing to Mary and saying, you'll be on the throne, this, this son of yours will be on the throne of the father of David, and he, his kingdom will never end. Okay? That was predicted right there at the birth of Christ. And now we see it uh, with David. And then we have the new covenant. And in the new covenant... We're going to talk just a little bit about Hebrews and what that is all about. Uh, and the New Covenant is, uh, we find mostly in 7, 21 through 22, it talks about the, uh, Jesus Christ and he is the king and priest after the order or the type of Melchizedek. Okay? Um, made from the gathering, made for the gathering ones who are believing. 
The gathering ones who are believing is the proper translation of ecclesia. Ecclesia is not translated church. <laughs> that is not what that word means, okay? And matter of fact, that word church is not even found in a lot of scripture. So what we have today and what is developed today has been built on the ecclesia, the assembly of God, the gathered ones who are believing, not the gathered ones who are checking it out. <laughs> Big difference. Big difference. Jesus fulfills prophecy in Jeremiah. He fulfills this prophecy in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 for the New Covenant. We've read that. We've studied that together. Uh, and we're well aware of that. So Jesus as high priest intercedes for us now, like Eddie said at the very beginning, in the right hand of the throne of God forever and ever. Okay? Back to the lecture notes. All right? So the next time I'm going to tell you that we meet Melchizedek is in Psalm 110, verse 4. And if you want to write some of these down, it will be helpful for you. We find some, uh, something that isn't found anywhere else in the Old Testament. I like finding those things. <laughs> you know, it's one of those kind of things that you can't find it anywhere else. It's only here. Okay? The Lord is to be a priest, not a Levitical priest. Jesus is not going to be a Levitical priest, not of the tribe of Levi. He's going to be, as the genealogies told us in Matthew 1 and in Luke 3, he's going to be a high priest after what? The tribe of Judah. That's David's throne. David's from the tribe of Judah. Okay? So the book of Hebrews tells us that Psalms, the psalm written by David, the subscription says by David, there's lots of controversy. If you read this book, he'll tell you some of it. But basically where it comes out, there's two oracles, and those oracles, when you look at them, and you study them, and you put them beside other things, you find out that basically David wrote No one else could have written them. And uh, so that's how it goes. I just don't want to get into all this historical criticism with you because of it gets too complicated, but it's important for you to know what the truth is. And the truth is that David wrote this. Um, and that's, that's important. Jesus has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, and that's found in Hebrews 7. Now I'm going to talk about Hebrews 7 just a little bit. First of all, Hebrews 7, 1 through 3. So write that down. It gives a quick summary. It's a quickie summary of Melchizedek as the king of Salem, how Abraham met him, and everything else that we just talked about in Genesis 14. Okay? But the name Melchizedek means, write these down, king, righteousness. And Salem means king of peace. So he is king, his name means righteousness, and he is the king of peace, and he gives God praise forever and ever. These titles are important because they're kind of a foreshadowing of what Jesus Christ himself will do. And the next thing that we learn about Melchizedek is he was without a father. Now this is interesting. There's no genealogy. No father, no mother. And by the way, Wes, what you and I were talking about earlier, that, that, that is related to that. There's no father, there's no mother, there's no way to trace it. And the point of the scriptures is, and it's gotten him into the priesthood, well, how did he become a, a priest? Or have anything to know, do with the priesthood? We'll see how that works. It's begotten of the new priesthood that God has already determined before the become 2,000 years before Christ appears on the scene. God determines that this will be the, the form of the new priesthood. The old covenant required Israel to give 10% of their wealth to the Levites, which is what we just talked about. But Abraham gave 10% to Melchizedek. 
even though he was not a Levite, and we talked about that in Hebrews 7, 6 through 7, it emphasizes Melchizedek's greatness. It says, he's not only received Abraham's tithe, but he blessed Abraham. Now who do you know <laughs> that can bless Abraham? <laughs> I mean, come on. We want Abraham to bless us. We don't know what the hell we're at. You know? So that's important. Hold on. Um, it's, a, it, it's important to know that. So he's blessing Abraham. The book of Hebrews is pointing that to Melchizedek as priesthood is more important, more important than the Levitical priesthood. That's what's coming out of this. That's where we're headed. The law was designated with the Levitical priesthood. The law was tied <coughs> to the Levitical priesthood. Correct? All right. <coughs> so what happens if you change the priesthood? You're no longer tied to the same law. Right on. You're no longer tied to the same law. <coughs> very, very important. The law we're tied to now is what? The new covenant. Yes, sir. It's the new covenant. It's the commands of Christ, the teachings of Christ. That's our new law. All right? And we have a new priest. And our priest is Christ now. So, Psalm 110 talks about another priesthood. The book of Hebrews places it and calls it a new covenant in 8.6. And the implication here is stated in 7.12. For when the priesthood is changed, the law must also be changed. Unquote. Right there. In 7.12. So Jesus was appointed as priest, not by law that focused on Levitical genealogy, but because he lives forever as God's right hand of the God Most High. Another reason the law of Moses is not enforced. No one from Moses' day has lived forever and can intercede for us. Who can do that? Only Christ. And that's the point. So Hebrews 7, 20 through 26, it becomes clear that God himself makes an oath to appoint Jesus as the high priest. That's in 7, 20 through 26 in Hebrews. And this high priest is a priest forever, as it says in 110, 4, the psalm. Because Jesus lives forever, he will forever continue to be our high priest. Now next, the Levitical priests had to offer sacrifices for their own sins. But Jesus, what does Jesus do? He is the sacrifice. He is the sacrifice for our sins. Big difference. Big difference. And he never sinned. So we have a pure sacrifice. He was the sacrifice for our sin. What the book of Hebrews is doing is proving that there is a greater high priest appointed by God who is superior to the Jewish Levitical priest. So in summary, uh, I know this is a lot, but it's important for you to catch this and get this because it's fascinating how back once again in Genesis, <laughs> if you can put the, we go back, uh, take John down and put the Genesis up there for me, uh, Jessica. Um, but Genesis, it's amazing how old this begins. God chose Melchizedek as a person. He wanted to teach these truths. And Abraham understood this because in Genesis 14.22, here's what Abraham says. I have lifted up my hands onto Jehovah, that's God, okay? And then he said, the God most high. Who do you learn that from? Melchizedek. That's who he represents, the righteous one, the God most high. Aaron's Levitical priesthood <coughs> dealt with the covenant of Israel. The covenant of Israel. Remember when all the confederations got together? They started to put this whole system together 
in order to rule, the Levites became the high priests. And they were the ones. The high priest entered once a year into the Holy of Holies, where the ark was. And uh, if you want to hear some fascinating things, you, know, you should read back in, in Leviticus how he was to dress and what he was to say and how he sprinkled blood on the altar. And, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating uh, process. So, Abraham himself admits this, and then, <clears throat> now, Chesedek is not the priest of Jehovah, of a nation, but he is the priest of the God Most High. It's called El Elohim, El Elohim, God Most High, above all gods, above every god, okay? And believers forever will have Jesus as their high priest. Now, just a couple conclusions. So how do we preach Christ from the Old Testament if our hermeneutic is law? Say again. How do, how do we preach Christ from the Old Testament if our hermeneutic is law? That's what he said. How do you do that? You preach that Jesus is the sacrifice instead of... Yeah. Instead of the animals. Well, the, yeah, yes. The point here is, if you're still under law, if your thinking is about my works, what I got to do, my moralism, my, my contribution to God, you're missing the point. The law no longer exists for you or me. It exists only in the Old Testament and for the nation of Israel during that period of time. And God found that that law was no longer sufficient. It, it, was old, it did not work to bring them to the place of purification that they need to be. So, passages like Genesis 14 show a sovereign plan for an amazing God announcing the promise first <clears throat> before the law was given, before the law was even given, God knew that it wasn't going to work. <laughs> but he, he gave it because it was a step he had to follow in his sovereign plan. Okay? The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Ah, now we come to the seed. <clears throat> Scriptures does not say, and to his seeds, plural. Does that mean Abraham was going to be blessed with one seed? I've heard some people say, oh, well, that's Isaac. No, that's not Isaac. If that were true, all the other things that Abraham said wouldn't make any sense. Who is the seed? The seed is Jesus. We're talking about Jesus. In Abraham's day. <clears throat> meaning one person who is Christ. <clears throat> what I mean is this. The law introduced about 430 years later from that time, from Abraham, <clears throat> does not set aside the covenant promise. It doesn't set aside the promise. What's a covenant promise? A seed. Okay? It doesn't set that aside. But it keeps that promise. And for if the inheritance depends on law, if it all depends on law, then we no longer depend on the promise. The promise has no effect if we're under law. But God, in His grace, gave it to Abraham through a promise. Another great example of God's sovereignty. How He starts at the beginning. At the very beginning. Now do you have some thoughts and understanding about how critical this is? When a scholar or a group of people get together and say, <clears throat> we need to rewrite the first 11 chapters. We need to redo some of this stuff. It's, uh, you know, I'm not so sure that was written there. It might have been written in the Second Temple period, you know. See what this does? It takes away your promise. Christ. 
God uses the Davidic covenant and David as a songwriter to announce the Levitical priesthood must go. It must change. And this implies that changing the priesthood, like we said, changes the law. And the law of Christ, his commands, his teachings, replace that with the new covenant. So we are under the new covenant. For out of the tribe of Judah, Hebrews 7, 14, Jesus the Messiah comes as king and priest in the order or of the type of Melchizedek. Okay? God reveals to David in Psalm 110 the answer to the deliverance of the Jews and the Gentiles for sin that they may all come together under the kingdom of God. Hebrews 7 to 4 says, For it is clear that our Lord descends from Judah, and in regards to his tribe, Moses said nothing about priests of Judah. There again. Both genealogies in Mark and Luke establish that Jesus descended from the tribe of Judah. That's the difference. Now, how badly did I confuse you? Are you okay? <laughs> Alright. The idea here is, is that you see all of this and this restoration period, all of this as one manuscript. Remember? We're not going to divide this into Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. No. We're going to look at it as one reading of a scroll of the sovereignty of God and what he is doing with his creation. And when you do that, you see that the gospel is introduced in Genesis, the new priesthood, the doing away with the Mosaic covenant is introduced 450 years before it even began. God has a plan. And that's what this guy says. Well, this is a little different than I do, but he's got the same idea. God has a plan, and he's working his plan through spiritual history. Okay? Any questions about all this? What do you think? Do the Jews recognize uh, Melchizedek and the teach on it? Yes. They do. They recognize it, but they what they do not see it is uh, replacing. They don't see it as a replacement. They see it as and or, you know, uh, along so with. So it's like either the Levite priests or. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, And what they did in doing that is that they, the the scripture says what we saw. David says in Psalm that they crucify Christ over and over again. And who else do we know that does that? There are religions out there today that, that do that on a, on a weekly basis, practically. So, when you don't understand how this works, it makes, it makes life very complicated. And it makes you feel like you've got to do something, or you've got to be somebody, or you've got to make a contribution. Or, you know, that's not what this is about. Everything that needs to be done throughout history, from the day you're born to the day you die, has already been done for you. What you need to do is believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And that regeneration process starts. You become justified on a legal basis. You become sanctified. And you are adopted and brought into the kingdom and glorified. You are already resurrected in the kingdom. All you're going to do is dump off this thing here <laughs> and get a new one. Which I can't wait for. <laughs> so it's just amazing. But I mean that's part of what this is all about. So now that you know this and you know that you cannot use the excuse of the law anymore or you can't be moralistic about life how does that change how you live? What does that do to you? 
when you're living not for Christ, but with Christ. And he goes to his father and says, Father, I want to talk to you about Eddie. You know, he knows you. The father knows you. He knows you. The Holy Spirit knows you. How do you now live? Do you live like under law? I don't think so. <laughs> you, you live by trying to be good all the time? You live by doing a lot of good works and, and trying to make everybody happy? Uh-uh. No. What do you do? You live for Christ. He apologized to you for having to be in this world. He said it many times. But he said, look, I came here to be with you. I did my thing. I went home. I'm sorry about what you have to go through here. It's trouble. They're going to drive you nuts. I know they are. Because they did that to me. Be of good cheer. I've overcome it. And I've also shot down the enemy. Satan only thinks he's powerful. And what he's going to do is end up with his non-powerful people in a very hot place. And you're going to be with God. And that's the difference in the kingdom of God. So I, th I think if I were you, I would start thinking, making a new axiom in my head. Who am I? Why am I so important? You told me in the last class that you have Christ living in your life. If that's true, if that's true, you're all brothers and sisters. If that's true, you're all going to be together someday. If that's true, you're going to live in this world differently than what D.A. Carson calls the average pagan. That's not the way you're going to live. You're going to treat each other differently. You're going to love differently. You're going to care differently. You're going to raise your children differently. Okay? For your daddies. <laughs> First of all, yeah, definitely get yeah, what you're saying in regards to not being moralistic about life. Um, definitely living for Christ. Um, not for him. You're not yeah, living for living, him anymore. You're living, living with him. him. Living with him. You're, yeah, that's, um, that's, that's one of those axioms you've got to change up here. It, you're not doing anything for God. Okay? You're living with him now. You're adopted. You're a member of the family. It's like you, you may have some disagreements with your dad or your mom or something like that, but you still get together on Christmas and you all sit around the table and argue uh, Thanksgiving and do your thing or whatever's involved. That doesn't matter. The bottom line here is you're in the family. You're in the family. There's no way out of the family. Okay. So, with regards to, uh, <laughs> so Ephesians 5, uh, okay. It basically says you make the best use of time because the days are evil, right? So there's that's a lot correct. of stuff that's pushing in on us. Oh, yeah. Look, listen, this is, you hit it on the head. The pressure that is on us. Can you put John back up here for me? The, the, the pressure that is on us in this world is unbelievable. We're living right now. I had a whole lecture. Uh, and by the way, this, this, this thing on John, I, I feel bad about this because I, I spent like 20 minutes telling you about this prayer, high priestly prayer, I got five sermons, an hour and a half a piece on that. I mean, it's there's so much in there you wouldn't believe what's there. And it's all there if you understand how you are glorified in the Father. How you bring glory to Jesus, you know, with your life and what you do. How he's willing to protect you. Until the day you get rid of this mortal life. Okay? 
it's, it's amazing, but the pressure, pressure today from a post, and we're living in a postmodern society, which is no fun. I don't know how many have kids, but you're trying to bring children up in a postmodern society, oh boy. You know, I thank God I'm older. Didn't have to go through that. But it's not easy. I mean, it's all about wealth, doing what you want to do, experimenting. Uh, you know, there are no absolutes. Breaking tradition. Everything, uh, breaking traditions. Everything's, uh, 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 you know, everything's, uh, uh, you know, relevant. I mean, I mean, there's no, there's no real absolute right or wrong. There is no good or evil. You know, I mean, it, it's, this is how they see it. And the scriptures, and you say, well, that doesn't affect me. Well, I can give you 20 examples of how it affects you. You know, you just don't see it because you're not looking for it. When you look for it, you see it. And you say to yourself, whoa. And on top of that, we have all the Christian churches and all the, all the Christian uh, people out there that are confused about things because of the kinds of things that they hear. They hear something over here, and then they hear somebody say, well, it may not be that, it could be this. And then, these are the Christians, okay? And one of the things that Christians do not spend a lot of time doing is reading and studying their Bible. They would much rather read a book about the Bible than read the Bible. This book, if you get it and read it, will help you. The Holy Spirit did not inspire the words. <laughs> Read it all by himself with his education. Okay. Now, he talks about inspired words of the scripture, and I'm very happy about that. But when you read this, the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you also, also, inspired these words. And he's going to give you insight. You don't have to be a scholar to get that insight and to understand what God was trying to do for you. That makes sense. It does. I think the thing that I struggle with a little bit is putting structure around that time of reading the Bible because mm -hmm. potentially that could look like moralistic legalism, right? So how it, do you? It could. It could. How do you, but, but, how but here's do you the difference. reconcile that? Here's here, here's the difference. When you put your arm around your wife and give her a kiss and you just say, oh, "I love you, honey," <clears throat> do you see that as a, a duty? And do you mind if your kids see that and say, boy, Dad's doing his duty? <laughs> huh. And if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. See, that's, it's not duty. That's not duty. It's not moralism. It's, what, what, what it is, is you're practicing your faith, your relationships. Okay? When Jesus talks to his father about you, and he talks to you know, you, through the Holy Spirit, I mean, he doesn't see that as a law. <laughs> it's, it's the law of love. <laughs> Paul says, there is no law against such things. You know? They don't exist. So, what we have to do is, here again, it's another axiom that's got to be changed. You've learned in this society that if you read this too much, you know, number one, be a kook. <laughs> number two, uh, you're really not going to, you're going to be a legalist. People are going to accuse you of bibliolatry, right? Oh boy, you know those crazy fundamental Christians, you know? Now, that's not what this is about. This is a book given to you by your father that now means something to you when you study it. And he wants you to study it and learn it. So that you can have what? A better working relationship with him. It's, it, it's not about, this is not going to tell you how to get along in the world. <laughs> I know people, they found passages in there. My son this morning is preaching to about 200, 250 young married couples. And guess what the subject is? Government. This is what they wanted to hear about. Government. So you know what he did? He went to Romans 13 
and he called me last night after he got back from a trip, and he talked about government. But we did it this way. Up here is a whole section on love in Romans 12, and right before starts 13. 13 talks about how you're to respond to the government, you're to pay your taxes, you to do the right things. But over here, right after that, it picks up with love again, and how you're to love. And his emphasis, what he was telling me he wants to get across to them, is the fact that, yes, we're to respect government, but when government impinges upon the kingdom of God in your life, you are no longer responsible to that authority. That's a big issue. We don't always think like that. Yeah. Yes, go vote. It doesn't matter if you're Democrat, Republican, or war joke. I mean, that's fine. That's fine. But when the law comes down from government that says, David, you cannot read your Bible. Now we have a serious issue. <laughs> now we have a serious issue, don't we? <clears throat> because that's his father's book. That's the kingdom he lives in. And it's getting to that. And it's getting to that. Yes, it is. That's about it. I said the pressure of the postmodern society. That's my point. Uh, Something you had a question earlier. What was it? Do you remember? I'm sorry. <laughs> Anything else? All right. We've got about 15 or 20 minutes, and I want to review sessions one through six. Let's have some fun. Okay? Find your, your little review sheet that says review sessions one through six. Does anyone need it? Huh? Does anyone need that hand up from last week? Go ahead. Yeah, if we um, didn't have the book of Hebrews, right. which elaborates a lot on the truth about Melchizedek and all the priestly things and things like that, mm -hmm. um, would you still see these same truths just in the Old Testament? Pretty much. Yeah, yeah. There's enough evidence in the Old Testament that really verifies all that. Uh, because a lot of people go at it like this. Well, we're not sure who wrote Hebrews. You know, maybe it was Paul, maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was Luke, maybe it wasn't. You know, and, and they can't make up their mind and all that kind of stuff. And, and maybe it was written in the second time period. It really wasn't. You know, and, and then they just moved it over and copied it over. Uh, you know, and that kind of thing. If, if you look at all those possibilities, and you look at what's written there, it's in sync with everything that's written in the Old Testament. So I do know one thing. Whoever wrote it knew the Old Testament. Which tells me we're leaning towards you, okay, in, in the writings. But I also understand that this person was, or persons, whatever, was bright enough to understand that this change in law to the new covenant is what the kingdom of God is really all about. And it's what we should be contending for. So that's why. It's never bothered me that we can't really nail down who wrote it, you know, because it's so consistent with everything else. Now, some scholars will tell you, of course, oh, it's not consistent with anything, you know. But, you know, you got to decide who you're going to look at, who you're going to follow and look at. Um, here again, I build my things around hermeneutic. And my, my hermeneutic tells me, if you tell me something over here, and it's not over here, it's a problem. It's got to be someplace else where I can prove that, you know, and make sense of it. And Paul is, if I had the time, we would have gotten into Paul and read all Paul's verses. I mean, they're just awesome. They just pull us together like ching, 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 you know. And Paul, he doesn't have a chapter on the kid the deck, but he says all the same things. <laughs> and so it's, it's very, very interesting you know, how it works. Okay, this should be fun because this is everything you know, right? You know all these things, right? <laughs> okay, and this is what you know. If you use the overview of the Gospel of John, right there, 
as a chart, as a literary guide, you can keep adding to that chart as you study and work with that and read this book again and, and add things. You know that your hermeneutic is to allow scripture to try to interpret scripture. And if you can't figure out a way to do that, you either got to call me or talk to Gary or you got to figure out a way to, to, to find that out if you're having a question. All right? You know that your methodology is you're going to see what's there first. You're going to observe what's there. Then you're going to ask some questions about what you've observed. Five W's and an H. Okay? Then you're going to start to interpret. But the first thing you're going to do before you say, I know what that means, you're going to ask some interpretive questions. What is the meaning of what is here? Why do they often put this here? What's the reason for this? What's implied by this? Now you can start to pull out a commentary or another book or read an article or talk to another professor or whatever you want to do. Okay? Then there's application and correlation. Now I know what I believe. Now I know how to apply it to my life. Okay? That's what we've been taught here. And I hope that you keep using it. Keep practicing it. Okay? Number two. When God created mankind, we were without sin. Has that ever occurred to you? Has it ever occurred to you that the same ancestor that gave us this mess was also created perfect? You know, there was a time. Until the test came along. Until the test came along. What a shame. We would have had a lot of fun with Jesus. <laughs> okay, we created in his image anyway. We're still created in his image. What does that mean? We have a rational mind. As much as you might love your animal, you're not talking to a rational cat. Trust me. <laughs> okay. All right. We have a sense of morality. It's built in. And, and we're, we, we know when we're moralizing, when we're trying to work our way to the kingdom, and when we're not. And an ability to have an internal fellowship with the Trinity. You just heard about that this morning again and again and again. You're being put in a place of superiority so that you can lead others. Sin enters mankind through Adam. We all know that. God participates with mankind through a, first of all, what did he do? He started out with a national kind of a theocracy. He got that rolling. And he appoints people to reveal his will. And then mankind wants a king. Remember that? Get in the kingdom period. The first time mankind did that and God didn't get involved, he ended up having to flood everything and get rid of everybody because their hearts were 100% all the time practicing evil. So man just can't get it together by himself. He needs some help. Okay? And so when God gets involved, and he gets involved with the nation of Israel, it doesn't take long for Israel to start saying, you know, we want a God. Everybody else has their own king. You know, why can't we have a king? Okay. So then we ended up with what? Saul, David, Solomon, a bunch of corrupt sons. You know, a mess. You know, and there we are with all the kings. But God was wise, as always, and along with those kings, he sent prophets. And when they didn't like what the prophets said, what did they do? Kill them. Kill them. <laughs> yeah. so, so we learned about that. It's led to the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, with a new covenant that stressed the importance of being born again in order to enter God's kingdom. Today we look at Christ as our Savior and depend upon him to indwell in the Holy Spirit, which is what gives us our life and our power, and our ability to be who we are. Three, redemptive plan and the gospel begins in Genesis 3.15. Adam and Eve. The covering of sin with the blood of an animal. God slain the first animal. That redemption, uh, by the way, is the Greek word for ransom. Paying a price. In the Septuagint, the earlier translation, means paying a price. Okay. Um, and, and uh, it says here, with the blood of an animal, the, it should be the flood 
and not the food. <laughs> <laughs> It's hard to get good though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The cleaning of sin, cleansing of sin. Then we have the nation of Israel. The annual sacrifices for sin. Then we have a law that has to reveal sin. Notice the law doesn't take away sin. It just reveals sin. And then the Levitical priest to carry out the blood sacrifices for sin. Well, and of course, what you've learned this morning is uh, that there's much more to that. Then the covenants. I don't have to repeat all those to you. You know your covenants by now. The intertestamental period. This is the biggie. God works through the Hellenization of the world, Alexander the Great. And so, Kelly, if anybody ever asks you at college or whatever about Alexander the Great, say yes. If it wouldn't have been for him, we wouldn't have the Greek Bible today. <laughs> so that's true. That's the Hebrew Old Testament. It's now translated into Greek. It's known as the Septuagint. And uh, we know about that. Six, the New Testament begins. Matthew and Luke records Jesus' genealogy and concludes that Jesus is from the Davidic covenant, son of David and son of Abraham. That's from Judah. This prepares the way for Jesus' authority to teach about his fulfillment of the law. You see now... How Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. Doesn't that take on a new meaning for you? Just think about that. When, when in, in Matthew, when they talk about, um, Jesus says, I didn't come to abolish the law, get rid of the law. I am the fulfillment of the law. Okay? Also almost an I am statement. Now, that doesn't mean, well, uh, well, Jesus kind of illustrated how we misunderstood the law. Uh, you know, thou shalt not kill. Well, if uh, if you if you uh, have thoughts about if they have thoughts about people, you're killing them already. They're killing your personality. You're, you know, uh, thou shalt not commit adultery. Well, all you guys who have looked at women to lust, you know, you already commit adultery. So there you go. You're all under law. You know, that's that's not fulfillment. What's fulfillment? Why is this so important? Jesus is the fulfillment of all law. What did you just learn today? It's not about law. It's about Him. All law resides from Him and in Him. And when you have a relationship with the Trinity, do you keep laws? No. We have to start getting our mind readjusted to thinking like a Christian. <laughs> it's hard because we're always putting ourselves down. And that's the society we live in, the culture. We're always saying something bad about ourselves. I mean, we need to just stop it. To quote Gary, stop it. <laughs> stop saying bad things about yourself. Think about who you are. There's people that think that we think higher of ourselves. We don't. We think more humble of ourselves. We are slaves. Hey, now we'll see. Yeah, we'll we'll see. One more, more we'll see. <laughs> that's a good one, and that's important. I'll, I'll go teach course on this sometime if you're out of it. <laughs> the word doulos, servant, serve, to serve in the New Testament is translated by every guy, by every person that I've ever heard about, except for one or two, uh, as servant. We are, are, are servants of Christ. We are, no. You, you want to get radical? Here's radical. That word only means one thing. Slave. You and I are God's slave. We have been bought with a price. We're not here to do any serving. We're here to do what we're told. 
and we are told to love people. We are told to care for one another. We are told to read and study. We're told that we have to see life differently. <clears throat> that we have to care differently. We have to love differently. That's what our master wants us to do. So here again, it's a, it's a brain thing where we got to teach ourselves who we are. You know? What's the alternative? You don't want that. I'd rather be a slave to Jesus any day of the week than go where other people are going ahead. It, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Six, the New Testament begins, Matthew and Luke record Jesus' genealogies. You know all about this. You know about the covenants. I don't need to explain that to you. Seven, worship starts at God in a tent, a tabernacle. It moves to Solomon's temple in Jerusalem, where David took the ark. And then it went to the second temple after the restoration period. However, with Jesus, worship moves where? Into your heart. You are the temple of God. You are. Not a building. You are the temple of God. God resides in you. He wants you to keep your temple clean. And occasionally, he comes in and helps you cleanse your temple. <laughs> like he did physically with the temple in his day. But the temple needs to be kept pure. And he wants you to stay pure. And you can do it. So, worship, uh, that's a whole other issue. Uh, we worship God in spirit and truth. And the, 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 the beautiful thing about that is, you know what, I always, I always had to laugh when, when uh, <clears throat> when young people uh, get married, you know, you do marriage counseling and stuff like that. It's kind of fun. And, uh, and you talk to them and all the rest of it. Uh, they always want to, want, to, want to use 1 Corinthians 13 uh, in their wedding someplace. Is there any way that you can use that in, in the wedding? Are we late? Well, you have a lot more. Oh. <laughs> 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 I wonder what I did. Okay. Um, so they always want to use that, you know. Do you know what that passage is sandwiched in? That whole thing? It's all about worship. 1 Corinthians 13 is how you should worship. Next time you read it, think of that. That's what it's about. It's not about, jeez, I love her so much. She's my girl. That's not what it's about. <laughs> it's about patience with yourself and with God in your relationship with the Trinity. It's about all those good things that have to do with your relationship to God. I love that thing. A lot of fun. <clears throat> Eight. The Old Testament is a messianic hope. It points to Jesus, especially Moses' his writings. And nine. How does the ruling body of the Jews accept the darkness, which we talked about, the evil plot with Jesus. The Jews have a very, very difficult life. They, it's not going to be easy for them in the end either. <laughs> and uh, those who believe that all the Jews are going to be saved and everything's going to be fine, that is not true. Not true. The Jews are not going to be able to sneer at Jesus and walk away. That's not the way it's going to happen. Uh, God permits evil in people's lives and events and uses his, uh, to use his sovereign plan, uh, which was forged, this whole plan, all of this was put together before the Trinity put the world in place. And us. I give you an idea of God's idea of foreknowledge. <laughs> I mean, it's far, it, you know, it's mind-boggling what God can do. Eleventh, symbols of light. We talked about Christ being the light, the darkness being evil. I gave you some Bible verses here so you can look them up if you want to. I talked about the Good Shepherd is here now. 
It's not the good shepherd that's coming. <laughs> He's here now. Okay? Exclusive access. He's the only way. He lays down his life for you and me and he unites those who have been given to him. I am the good shepherd. There it is. All the references. Old and New Testament. Seven signs give opportunity for faith and belief and understanding God's sovereignty. We've been through all the seven signs. Raising Lazarus. Those who believe are raised now. I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus, number 15, is the only life giver. There is no other life giver. He's the only one. Jesus is the Son of God, the giver of eternal life, the declarer of judgment, and his resurrection power. 16, what makes God weep? I hope you get this one. What makes him weep? evil's captivity of the Jews and Gentiles, you and me, then and today. He, he doesn't like it when we don't see him. When darkness comes over us and we fail to be who you really are. It makes him sad. He grieves. The Holy Spirit grieves over you and me. We're important. We're important to God. Nicodemus embodies a broken religion and an out-of-date covenant, which we saw. And the kingdom of God now requires Jews and Gentiles to be born again, both of water and the Spirit. And we learned that it was not baptism. And, uh, it's a purifying water of the Spirit. A simple profession of faith, and this is important, a simple profession of faith is no longer acceptable. Oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, yeah, I went to church one time. <laughs> yeah. Or I believe in Jesus. Just look at all the stuff I do. I volunteer for everything here. You know? It's not acceptable. Nor is believing we can make a can contribution to our salvation through some kind of moralism. Good works and activities. Moralism believes the gospel can be reduced to a modification of human behavior by good works. All I gotta do is change my behavior and and and, and God will take it. Can't do anything. Can't do anything. That's right. And and I wrote that up last week, your theory. Yes, you something did. about that. Yeah, that's very good. That's You're right, Kevin. Yeah. What do you think? That's only half of the course. I'll give you another and the other half. <laughs> but, you know, we've got maybe, what, three more sessions to go? And uh, we're going to close here in a second. Is there any, are there any other issues or concerns that you have? Do you have homework? Yes. Your homework is to do the homework you haven't done. <laughs> okay, some of you have not done the homework. I know you haven't. And, and you do not know your Bible verse yet. If you look on your sheet that says, what should I do? And you get a freebie week uh, to memorize, to, to, to learn your verse. And don't memorize it rotely. Take that sheet that I gave you that had an outline and try to understand it. What you saw Tom do this morning, I think, uh, I got it, right now, um, uh, in front of you, was so obvious that he knew what Isaiah meant. It was clear in his mind. He could have talked on that for 20 more hours. He had it. He didn't go, and uh, Isaiah said, uh, you know, and try to get it down. No, that's not what he did. He understood it. He knew why it was there. He knew the implications of it. And he was dramatic about it in his mind. And he saw it. And the words just fell in place for him. That's how he memorized it. That's how I want you to memorize this. One verse. 
Gary would not be proud. He got out of here with that one word. <laughs> you came out of it a lot, huh? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you got to get this down. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Who would like to pray? Dismiss us with a prayer. Anyone? All right, go ahead. Father, we thank you for bringing us together here to study your Bible and to learn about uh, the amazing things that you're doing in the Old and New Testament and what you're doing in our lives, for bringing clarification to us, and for renewing our sense of love with you, that it's not about us working uh, moralistically to serve you, God, but it's about just being with you, loving you, and walking our lives with you. Lord. pray that you would be with us throughout our weeks, that we would memorize the verse and do the homework and just find the love and joy of studying your word and spending time with you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Very, very, thank you. Okay. Have a good week and what? Pray for each other. Remember to pray for each other. Your brothers and sisters. <laughs>